Good morning and happy Mother's Day to all you mums out there. Um, I just have a few announcements for you before we start the service. If you know of anyone who is struggling during this time, um, Plus One is alive and well, so please pass the word around if um, anyone is in need of that. If you want to give during this time, obviously we can't pass the offering bag around. Um, but you can still give with uh, e-transfer at donations at mcdougallchapel.com. Um, that should be on your screen. Also, make sure you visit the website, mcdougallchapel.com. There's lots of information on there. Uh, there are Zoom meetings happening every week. Uh, Embrace is now online as well. Information about that is there as well. And uh, the 4-Minute Adventure is also there. Um, if you need to contact the office for any reason, the office hours are Monday to Friday from 9.30 to noon, and feel free to get a hold of Pastor Kent anytime if there's anything you need. So with that, I'm just going to open us with a word of prayer. Jesus, thank you for this morning. Thank you that we can meet together, um, even though it's not in the way we would probably prefer. I just pray that you would bless this service, that you would uh, just speak to each one of us wherever it is that you have us at. And we just give it all to you. In Jesus' name, amen.
verse for you. Uh, again, Psalms 139. This is the Passion Translation again. And it's verse um, 34b, sorry, 14b, to about 18a. <laughs> How thoroughly you know me, Lord. You even formed every bone in my body when you created me in the secret place, carefully, skillfully shaping me from nothing to something. You saw who you created me to be before I became me. Before I'd even seen the light of day, the number of days you planned for me were already recorded in your book. Every single moment you were thinking of me. How precious and wonderful to consider that you cherish me constantly in your every thought. Oh God, your desires toward me are more than the grains of sand on every shore.
Well, good morning again, and welcome to our prayer time. This definitely has thrown me for a loop doing prayer time this way. I miss having all of you in the pews and sharing your requests and uh, praises and hurts and excitements with us. Um, if there's any way that we can pray for you during this time, please feel free to let us know. Being Mother's Day, I wanted to start off with a story. On a hot July morning, I awoke to the clicks of a broken fan blowing humid air across my face. That got me thinking about all the other things that had broken down in my life. Parenting a daughter who has Down syndrome presents unique challenges. Although Sarah's heart surgery and many serious infections were over, now we faced catastrophic hospital bills. On top of that, my husband's job would be eliminated in just weeks, and losing our home seemed inevitable. As I closed my eyes to try to put together a morning prayer, I felt a small hand nudge my arm. Mommy, Sarah said, I, 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 I g g got ready for v vacation b Bible school all by myself. Next to the bed stood five-year-old Sarah, her eyes twinkling through thick, pink-framed glass glasses. Beaming with pride, she turned both palms up and exclaimed, Ta-da! I noticed her red-checked seersucker shorts were on backward, with the drawstring stuck in the side waistband. A J.C. Penney price tag hung from the front of a new green polka dot top, also on backward. She had chosen unmatched red and green winter socks to go with the outfit. Her tennis shoes were on the wrong feet, and she wore a baseball cap with the visor and emblem turned backward. I, I, I packed a b backpack too, she stammered, while unzipping her bag so I could see what was inside. Curious, I peered in at the treasures she had so carefully packed. Five Lego blocks, a box of unopened paper clips, a fork, an undressed Cabbage Patch doll, three jigsaw puzzle pieces, and a crib sheet from the linen closet. Gently lifting her chin until our eyes met, I said very slowly, you look beautiful. Thank you, Sarah smiled as she began to twirl around like a ballerina. Just then the living room clock chimed eight o'clock, which meant I had 45 minutes to get myself, two toddlers, and a baby out the door. As the morning minutes dissolved into urgent seconds, I realized I was not going to have time to change Sarah's outfit. Buckling each child into a car seat, I tried to reason with Sarah. Honey, I don't think you'll be needing your backpack for vacation Bible school. Why don't you let me keep it in the car for you? N no, I need it. And so I surrendered telling myself her self-esteem was more important than what people might think of her knapsack full of useless stuff. When we got to church, I attempted to redo Sarah's outfit with one hand while I held my baby in the other. But Sarah pulled away, reminding me of my early morning words. No, I l look b beautiful. Overhearing our conversation, a young teacher joined us. You do look beautiful, the woman told Sarah. Then she took Sarah's hand and said to me, you can pick Sarah up at 11.30. We'll take good care of her. As I watched them walk away, I knew Sarah was in good hands. While Sarah was in school, I took the other two children and ran errands. All the while, my thoughts raced with anxiety and disjointed prayer. What did the future hold? How would we provide for our three small children? Would we lose our home? These painful questions caused me to wonder if God loved us. I got back to the church a few minutes early. A door in the sun-filled chapel had been propped open, and I could see the children seated inside in a semicircle, listening to a Bible story. Sarah, sitting with her back to me, was still clutching the canvas straps which secured her backpack. Her baseball cap, shorts, and shirt were still on backward. Watching her from a distance, I became aware of warm emotion welling within. One thought rushed through my mind, one simple phrase, I sure do love her. Then as I stood there, I heard that still comforting voice that I have come to understand is God's. That's the way I feel about you. I closed my eyes and imagined my creator looking at me from a distance. My life, so much like Sarah's outfit, backward, 
unmatched, mixed up? Why are you holding that useless backpack full of anxiety, doubt, and fear? I could imagine God saying to me, let me carry it. I sensed that God was speaking not only to me, but to all those who struggle with lives that seem backward, inside out, and out of control. We all want to be financially secure, free from illness, and immune to the inevitable pain that life brings. But God calls us to trust that what we need will be provided. It is in these vulnerable times of weakness that we need to give our fear-filled backpack to the one who says, you are precious in my eyes and I love you, Isaiah 43, 4. That night, as I once more turned on our crippled fan, I thanked God for the privilege of parenting Sarah. Through her, I realized God had been revealed to me in a new way. I just thought that was very fitting uh, being Mother's Day, but also just in the times that we're in, um, just being reminded to give up that burden that we carry. I've been reminding you every week um, to check out the u website unite714.com um, that encourages us to pray together as believers as, um, all over the world. And so I encourage you to continue checking that out. Um, today their focus on ch is on choosing to praise despite everything that's going on, through everything that's going on. Um, and we're also going to focus this week on praying for moms and the ways that they um, are struggling through this. So let's go to prayer together. Jesus, thank you for who you are. Thank you for being love to us. You are truth, you are peace, you are faithful, and we just praise you for who you are. You are greater than everything that's going on around us, and you, you have it all in your hand, and we just thank you. We thank you for what you're doing through this time in people's lives. We may recognize some of it, and we may not. Um, I know that I'm sure that there are things that are going on that, that we don't recognize, and you are working, and we thank you for that. And we anticipate what you are going to continue to do through this time. Lord, I think today of mums as uh, life looks very different right now for many of them. We think of moms who are tired, just worn out. Pray that you would give them rest. Think of moms who are homeschooling for the first time or maybe again, um, but it just isn't something they're used to and it's wearing on them. I pray that you'd give them patience. Pray that you'd give them eyes to see their kids the way that you see them and to love them the way that you love them. Think of moms who are working and trying to juggle home and, and work. Pray that you'd give them the strength that they need. Pray for moms who are stressed about finances. Pray that you would help them to trust you. And I'm sure there are moms in other situations that I haven't thought of, but you know each one of them, Lord. And I just pray that you would help each one of us to give our backpacks of anxiety, of fear, of whatever it is that's holding us down, that we would pass them over to you and let you carry them for us. Pray that you would bless each one of the moms in our congregation, who's and those who are listening um, today, Lord, that you would just encourage them today. Lord, I pray for Pastor Kent as he comes in a little bit to share that uh, you would give him exactly the words that you have for him to share today. You know how all of this has 
disrupted his schedule as well and changed things for him. And I just pray that you would give him peace and um, confidence as he shares what you have spoken to him this week. Just be with each of us this week and help us to honor you as we go about our days. In Jesus' name, amen. So just before Pastor Kent comes up, we are going to watch a video um, nicknamed The Mumtage, um, just a tribute to mums um, that is kind of all that we can do at this time. We can't give you flowers. We would love to, um, but mums, be encouraged. Know that you're loved, and we hope we can see you soon. Good morning, everyone, and uh, out there in TV land, I guess I've always wanted to say that. Oh, hey, everyone out there in TV land. I know you're not in TV land. Maybe you're watching on your TVs or your computers or on your phones, whatever it may be, but um, welcome to McDougal Chapel this morning. It's great that you could join us for our service. Thank you, Heidi, for leading us in that prayer time, and thank you for uh, Rachel and the worship team for leading us in singing today. Um, I've been learning so much from this series that we're doing in Colossians and and there's so much that's been that's that I've been kind of soaking in myself and hopefully some of you are getting something out of it as well but the one thing that I've been learning especially from the passage we're going to look at today is that each one of us needs someone in our lives to encourage us we all need that someone that can take an interest in our lives and someone that can, can help us in our daily walks with Jesus and also our daily walks just uh, in life in general. I look at back at my life and I can see many occasions where people have come into my life and they've been encouragement to me. That's really what moms do, isn't it? And I think of my mom and she was always an encourager for me and she always would um, walk beside me when I needed someone to walk beside me. And I remember as a kid, I would always ask my mom, and this always just blew me away. Um, I would say, mom, who, who's your favorite kid? And there's three of us in my family. I'd say, mom, who's your favorite child? And she would always look at me and just say, well, of course you are. It's you. And I spent years thinking I was the favorite child, but then I found out, you know, just uh, not too long ago that she said the same thing to my brother and my sister as well. So it really wasn't that special. But the reality is, is that she was an encourager to me. And, and, I, and, and that's what moms do. Now, before we go any farther, I'm not going to speak a lot about moms, uh, just at the fact that they are the ultimate encouragers in our life for many of us. But I also want to address the fact that not everyone has here that's listening has a good relationship with their mom. And sometimes our moms have not been that person who's been an encourager for us. Or some of us are um, maybe from homes where um, um, if you're a woman, you want to be a mom and you can't be a mom. There's so many mixed emotions that come with Mother's Day. And I just want to make sure that I acknowledge that right now. And I want to tell you that I have deep respect for you. 
and that we are walking alongside you the best that we can, and we will continue to pray for you. That's not how it should be. That's not how God created moms to be. And I just wanted to make sure that that was acknowledged, and I'm not assuming that everyone has a great mom. But for me, my mom, she was an encourager. Another person that was an encourager in my life was when I was in grade 10, I was going to play basketball, and I was really nervous to try out for the senior basketball team, and it's a grade 10 student in a pretty big high school. And I remember the basketball coach coming up to me, and he just kind of put his arm around me in the hall and said, Kent, I want you to come and try out for the basketball team. I think you're going to do really good. And I remember him saying that to me, and what an encouragement that was to me, because no one else was telling me that I, I, I had a chance but when the coach came up and put his arm around me and said, Kent, I think you should try out those simple words. They were very small. And as far as a sentence goes, he didn't spend a lot of time with me at that moment, but he became one of my biggest encouragers. And then I ended up making the team and he became one of my biggest cheerleaders throughout that season as I was one of the youngest people on that team. I think back to my first church first church I ever pastored in Carlisle, Saskatchewan, and it was a tiny church. Um, it's really was, <laughs> as I stand here, I think, well, it was like preaching to an empty room, really what it was like. It was a super small church. And, uh, but some of the people there were, were just really, it was a really hard place to be a pastor. And I got very discouraged very easy. I was young. I was probably a little bit arrogant, a little, um, little uh, um, hard-headed, whatever it may be. And, and I was getting beat up big time in the church. And I remember a man coming to me, he was our district supervisor at the time, and he came up to me and just put his arm around me and said, Kent, I want to tell you that you have great potential as a pastor. And I remember that those words so clearly, how they were such an encouragement to me. When someone encourages us, usually it comes at the right time. Usually it's the perfect time, and it's usually exactly what we need. Because we start to realize that we can't do life on our own strength. We can't, um, we can't be all we want to be all by ourselves. We just weren't made that way. And sometimes we need someone to kick us in our pants. And sometimes we need someone to put their arm around us. Sometimes we need people to point us to God and to remind us what our purpose in life is. But we can never forget those people who have encouraged us over the years. I want you to think about your life. Are there people that have walked alongside you? How did it feel? Was it a good thing? Were they encouragers for you? And I want you just to take a moment, even in your mind today, to think of those people. And maybe you need to take some time this week to thank them for being an encourager. And especially Mother's Day, make sure you let your, wife, your mom know that she is an encourager for you. As we continue our series at risk, this will all apply in some level. Um, but we, we're going to continue our story, our series at, called At Risk. And it's, just, it's, a, it's a series about this young church in Colossae that was uh, 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 written, uh, received a letter from the Apostle Paul while he's in prison. And this, this, uh, this, this church was young. Okay? It was feeling pressure from society. There was pressures from within the church with the rules. And they had come to a place where they were going, we need some encouragement. And so Paul writes this letter, and, he, he, and, he, and he, he's going to use this letter to speak truth into this church, but he's also going to spend some time, as we're going to see in the passage today, where he encourages that church. You see, that church is in a little bit of a tug-of-war. They had pressures around them pulling them one way, and then they had pressures that they knew were right pulling them the other way, and they were having to distinguish, you know, what is from the Lord and what should we just kind of discard, and there was great pressure on them. So Paul comes in as this encourager, and, uh, and that's what we're going to find in this passage today, that he's going to tell them there's something good that's yet to come. I want to tell you this. You may not feel like you guys are doing a good job as a church, but there's something better that's yet to come. It's so easy, folks, to become discouraged, especially in this time that we live in. There's pressures that are pulling us different ways. It's kind of like a little bit of a tug of war. Um, things are changing around us so rapidly with this COVID-19. Um, job opportunities are changing. Our living circumstances are changing. Our relationships are not looking the same because of all the distancing that we have to do. Money's tight. The future looks cloudy. It gets so depressing. When was the last time someone told you there's good still to come? When was the last time you told somebody 
there is good still to come. And Paul writes this book to this church in the first century. And I want to tell you that the passage we're going to read today is just as relevant today as it was back then. And it's a story that says the good is yet to come. I'm going to read this passage to you. It's kind of lengthy. But I want you to remember that it's from uh, um, Colossians chapter 1, verse 24 to chapter 2, verse 5. So it's uh, quite a few verses. But I'm going to read the whole thing. But as I read it, I want you to just to remember exactly the context. Paul, along with Timothy, are writing this letter to people they've never met. And listen carefully to the tone that Paul has for these people, this church, as he writes this, pres- writes this letter from prison in Rome. And I want you to imagine just for a moment that he's writing it to you. That this part of, of, of this encouragement is written just for you. That's what I did when I was reading it this week. And uh, when I was done reading it, I came up with three points that kind of popped out in my head about that, that, that Paul kind of spoke through this passage and they were very applicable to me. And I want to share them with you, but I want you just to kind of do that exercise for yourself. And just as I read this passage, consider this letter written just for you. I'm glad when I suffer for you in my body, for I am participating in the sufferings of Christ that continue for his body, for for his body, the church. God has given me the responsibility of serving this church by proclaiming his entire message to you. This message was kept secret for centuries and generations past, but now it has been revealed to God's people. For God wanted them to know the riches and glory of, of Christ are for you Gentiles too. And this is the secret. Christ lives in you. This gives you assurance of sharing his glory. So we tell others about Christ, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all the wisdom God has given us. We want to present them to God, perfect in their relationship to Christ. That's why I work and struggle so hard, depending on Christ's mighty power that works within me. I want you to know how much I have agonized for you and for the church at Laodicea and for many other believers who have have never met me personally. I want them to be encouraged and knit together by strong ties of love. I want them to have complete confidence that they understand God's mysterious plan, which is Christ himself. In him lie hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I'm telling you this so no one will deceive you with well-crafted arguments. For though I am far away from you, my heart is with you, and I rejoice that you are living as you should and that your faith in Christ is strong. When you're struggling, something truly amazing happens when someone shares those struggles. Some of my deepest pains that I've had in my life is, is when someone who has gone through the same journey as me and kind of walked beside me and it's helped me heal so much better and so much faster. So I ask you this question before I get into these points that kind of popped out to me. It's, the question is this, where is your struggle today? Really look into your heart and ask that question. Where is your struggle? Maybe you feel like you've been treated unfairly. Maybe uh, it's your daily troubles, daily struggles that you have. Maybe you don't feel understood. But Paul writes that passage that I just read. He's in prison because he followed Jesus. He wasn't being treated fairly. He had some daily hardships. He was not understood. And the thing that really stood out to me in this passage, and it's really the heart of this whole passage, is that Paul was struggling too. He's struggling as he wrote this. And it just kind of points out to me that you're not alone as you suffer. You're not alone as you suffer. This is really the the whole gist of this passage, is that you are not alone. As Paul writes this letter, he's writing from a place of, of hardship, and he's writing to a church that's in hardship, and he's saying, we're in this together. When I was a skinny kid in, the, in my 20s, I was working for a stucco crew. It was my first stucco job. And the very first job that I got um, was being a laborer. I was a laborer on this crew. And that's, you have to do that before you can actually become a plasterer. Okay, so I was working as a laborer. And my job was to mix the mud and, and I, and the, the, or the cement. And I, my job was to get it to the plasterers. So we were working in Calgary, we were working on these three-story walkouts, these giant buildings. Um, they were probably 30 feet, 30 feet up. And uh, we had to get the mud 
up to the very top where the people are plastering. And so what we did to do that was we, uh, we used this, this mechanism that was a really ro a rope and pulley. There's a big five gallon bucket in the bottom and then they put a rope on it, and put it up to a pulley on top and then you pull this bucket of mud up. So here I am, this skinny kid, I'm in my 20s, not feeling very strong. I probably thought I was pretty strong. And I filled up my first bucket of mud and I tried to pull it up and I couldn't get it up more than 10 feet. And I was thinking, oh my goodness, I cannot do this job. And I remember those, those first few days only being able to put up half buckets of mud and, and uh, people are laughing at me and you know all those kinds of things you do on the construction site. And I was feeling those, so discouraged. And I remember this one plaster, I was making some, some, some cement in the front of the building and they were all in the back and he came up to me and he just says, Kent, I want you to know that I know exactly how it feels. When I first started working here, I couldn't lift a bucket of mud up either. And I want to let you know that if you keep working at it, someday you're going to be able to do it. And he was exactly right. It wasn't more than a week and a half. And I was filling up full buckets of mud. And I was hauling them up the rope and pulley. And I was carrying them up ladders and doing all those things. And it was pretty amazing what that man's words were to me that encouraged me. He says, I've suffered with you exactly like you're suffering now. I know what it's like. And that's what Paul is saying in this letter. He says, I know what it's like to have hardships. I know what it's like to really struggle. And that is an amazing gift, is empathy. Empathy is an amazing thing we can give people. It's easy, so easy to focus on ourselves and say, my problem's the biggest or my feelings are the most important and my struggle's worse than yours. But when we can develop an attitude of empathy to other people and people show it to us, it's an amazing how that can help us through the struggles that we're in. So the very thing that first thing that pointed out to me is that we're not alone in this, in this battle that we're on in this world and this earth. And even in your own personal life, you're certainly not alone. Someone has walked that journey before and someone's going to walk that again in the future. The next thing that popped out for me is the secret that Paul's talking about. He says in verse 27, and this is the secret. Christ lives in you. This gives you assurance for sharing his glory. Want to know what that secret is? Well, it pops out to me that there's hope in Jesus Christ. In the midst of our struggles, Paul says, whether you're Jew, whether you're Gentile, if you're part of God's body, if you're part of the body of Christ, that you can trust Jesus for forgiveness for your sins, there is assurance, there's confidence that you can have because Jesus lives in you. Paul was in prison. Christ lived in him. And what that means is that as he's following Jesus, the Holy Spirit was leading him everywhere he went. And he had surrendered to the lordship of, his, in, in, lordship of Jesus in his life. And he was going through this journey knowing that Christ lived in him. And he had confidence and assurance to do things that he wouldn't be able to do in his own strength. For a church that is struggling, there was hope in knowing that if Christ lives in them, there is, there is a hope there's a hope they have, and there's confidence, and there's hope for you if you are struggling to know that if Christ lives in you, there is hope. So here's the question that I need to ask. Does Christ live in you? There's some confusion what that means. Many people think it's a token prayer that says, Jesus, come into my heart, and Christ, now that's all you need to do to have Christ live in you. But here's what it really means. It means that, that, that when you say to Jesus Christ says, and say, I want you to change my life, I want you to rule my life, and the old you is gone, and the new person has come, and no longer are you the center of attention, Jesus Christ is the center of attention, he's the king of kings, and he's the Lord of lords of your life, then all of a sudden you are starting to live like Christ lives in you because the old you is no longer in existence. I know this. And you need to know this, that the struggles of life do not go away when, you, when Christ lives in you. Paul didn't get thrown out of prison when he said Christ lives in me. He still had to live in prison. But what changes is this, is that there's a confidence that you can have that the things of this world do no longer are the ones that are ruling. The one that rules is Jesus Christ, the one that lives in you. And that is where our confidence comes from. That is where our hope comes from. So you're not alone. Christ lives in us, and that's the secret. And here's the last one, is that there is hope and there is an opportunity to thrive in life. Listen to verse uh, three in chapter two. 
It says, in him lie hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I'm telling you this so no one will deceive you with well-crafted arguments. When you put your hope in Jesus Christ and he lives in you and the Holy Spirit starts to guide you, then what happens is there's a hidden wealth of treasure and knowledge, of, of wisdom and knowledge that you can tap into. And it's not, it's not something that you go, oh, I think I'll just take this out of my, my wisdom hat and put it in for today. No, what it is is a, an assurance, a confidence that says, Holy Spirit, wherever you go, I know that you're going to be with me and you're going to be guiding me. When we follow Jesus, what happens then is that no one and nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. When you have that wisdom and knowledge that the Holy Spirit gives us, you can walk through struggles that you are facing. Doesn't mean the struggles go away. You can just navigate them just a little bit differently. I heard somebody say once that the problem is not the problem. The attitude to the problem is our problem, okay? And I always tell that to my kids and they roll their eyes and go, oh, dad, here's t- telling me these stories again about this, uh, the attitude to the problem and all that kind of stuff. But I want to change that a bit to the context of what I'm saying. What you're facing today, folks, is not the problem. It is who you are trusting with the problem that's the problem. The choices are really this. You can choose to trust yourself and the voices you hear around you, or you can choose to say, I live in Christ, and I follow him, and I trust him for my wisdom and my knowledge. So here's the challenge. We understand that we're not alone in our struggles, we understand that Christ lives in us and, and, and there is a secret that comes in that and there's a hope and assurance that comes with that. Then why do we still, and this boggles my mind because I do this, but why do we still live life alone and why do we put our hope in our, in our own strength and not in Christ? I can see in my life that I do this over and over again and I struggle over and over again. And I know this and I think the only reason that I don't, I, I'm not bold enough to come forward and say, hey, I need people in my life and I need to put my life, my, my trust in Jesus Christ for that assurance and for that confidence is that I feel so much shame for what I've done because of sin in my life that I don't want to ask for help and I don't want people to walk beside me. There is no condemnation for those who put their trust in Jesus Christ. But it's our responsibility if we want to thrive in this world is that we need to, first of all, find someone to walk this journey with you. You need to find somebody. If you're not part of a church, I'm asking you, why not? Why not? A church is full of people that are like-minded, that are going through the same struggles that you are, that are willing to walk with each other and walk uh, alongside each other and help each other, just like Paul was helping this church in Colossae. And if you haven't put your hope in Jesus Christ... You're missing out of the source of wisdom and knowledge that comes from the Holy Spirit. You're missing out on your confidence and the hope that you could have. It's just not there because we put our own, our, our confidence in our own self and it usually never turns out very good when we do that. In John chapter 8, it says this. Jesus said to the people who believed in him, You are truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teachings. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Freedom's at stake here, folks. If we, um, you have to be remain faithful, not compromise your heart, not walking on on, on the fence. We have to remain faithful to be set free. So Paul ends this passage that I read with a little statement that really impacted me this week. Verse 5, chapter 2, verse 5, it says, And I rejoice in you who are living as you should, and that your faith in Christ is strong. What caught my attention is that he's speaking in the future tense. At the time of this writing, the church that he's writing to is not having their faith in Christ. It's not strong, and they're not living as they should. But he speaks to them as an encourager that simply says, I know that you're going to live as you should. And I know that you're going to have faith faith in Christ and you're going to be strong. And Paul believes in though that church even before they deserve to be believed in. I remember those people that spoke into my life. Our moms, 
my high school basketball coach, my district superintendent, they spoke into me and they spoke in the future tense. My mom believed in me. My basketball coach said, you're going to do a great job as a basketball player before I even knew if I was going to do a great job as a basketball player. My district superintendent said, you're going to be a good pastor even before he knew I was going to be a good pastor. And Paul is writing to this church and saying, even though you have struggles, I know you're going to be a great church. I rejoice that you're living as you should and that your faith in Christ is strong. And he says that even before it happened. So I want to tell you all here today that I believe in you. I don't even know everyone that listens, but I believe in you because I know this, is that there are people that are around you that know what it's like to walk in your shoes. There's people with the same kind of struggles. But when you put your life in Christ, there's an amazing assurance that happens that gives us hope And that if we surrender to the Lordship of Jesus Christ in our life, we can thrive in the world that we're living in, even though the world is a mess. And I believe in you. And there's hope. And I can even speak into the future that if you do those things, if you find someone to walk with you, if you surrender to the Lordship of Jesus Christ for your life, you're going to thrive in a world that says... It's falling apart. So I hope you're encouraged. When the Apostle Paul wrote this letter, this part of the passage was to encourage the church. And I want to let you know that you are worth encouraging. If you're here today and you're listening and you've been struggling and you don't know how to get out of that funk, I want to let you know that it's really simple. Let Jesus lead you out. Take advantage of that secret and let him into your life. Surrender to him. Say, God, I'm a sinner. I need your help. I can't do it on my own. I give you my life. And you're going to find, and I promise you, that you're going to find wisdom and knowledge as you follow the Holy Spirit like you never knew before. But you have to do it. You have to say, enough of me, the old is gone, the new has come. And if you're here today and you're going, Ken, I I know all this stuff, then I just ask you this question. Why aren't you walking with somebody? Why aren't you helping somebody? You need, people need an encourager and you're just the person for that job. what we do as followers of Jesus. We walk with each other. So I'm going to just pray. If you got any questions about what I said, uh, go to mcdougalchapel.com, send me a message. I'd chat with you online. I'll chat with you on the phone. It doesn't matter. I'd love to chat with you. Heavenly Father, I just want to lift up so deeply today uh, the people that are listening here. For those that are struggling and their the life is a tug of war. Pressure is pulling one way and knowing what's the uh, Um, what's right is the other way and not knowing how to respond. I just pray right now that they would, first of all, know that they're not alone. There's people that are walking with them, but also know, Lord, that there is a God who loves them so much that he sent his son to die on a cross and that we just need to surrender to you. God, I just pray that our own pride and our own selfishness wouldn't get in the way, that we could say, Lord, I want you to be Christ. I want you to be in my life. That, that you in return would just, the Holy Spirit would just walk with the person, give them hope, help them to thrive, not because the circumstances around them to change, but because how they look at those circumstances change. So God, I'm not even sure what else to pray. I will pray this, that you go before my words today, make them yours. For followers of Jesus, Lord, Help them to reach out to those that don't know you and that need encouraging. And pray these things in your name. Amen.
Isn't it amazing that grace like rain falls down on me? I'll tell you what happens. It's because God believes in you. He believes in you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May God give you his precious peace. Amen.